So when you talk in front of a group, you always like to be set up for success. And uh, I find myself going after lunch, um, in the last keynote of the day. And there's a small detail of going after our, our friend here, Tim Keller. Um, but I'm up for the challenge, I think. What I'd like to do first is do a very quick 15-second stretch break. That means stand up, put your hands over your head, stretch, and then sit back down. So I, I didn't plan it this way, but I think uh, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about, I think, a very poor execution and lesson of application around what Tim just spoke about, um, which is the life of a Christian entrepreneur and what I call the paradox of being a Christian entrepreneur. And so I'm going to speak about that this afternoon. Um, and I, I want to start by this thought. I don't know if you've seen uh, these kitschy kind of buttons or T-shirts or desk, you know, wear that says it's all about me. Have you seen that before? Anybody seen those out there? Um, so I had somebody in my workplace that, had, that, that always talked about that in a very joking way, and I always scoffed at that and, and said, oh, gosh, you know, how could it be always all about you? Um, uh, and, and then uh, I thought about, you know, that's, that, of course that's not me because I was the one that left Wall Street to go work in the South Bronx. I was the one that left money to, to, to work for nothing. Uh, I was the one that left the, the power corridors of New York City to work in the underserved communities of the Bronx. Um, of course, it would never be all about me. Uh, life, as you know, has a funny way of exposing our idols, and has a funny way of uh, revealing who we really are. And, I, and what I have found is that the farther I got away from Wall Street, the farther I got away from uh, what we would call these powerful professions, and the more I've got into the world of serving others, uh, the idol of it's all about me has become stronger. And I've had to fight and fight and fight that idol every day. And I think as a Christian entrepreneur, uh, that is one of the great challenges that as we go in to fill a need to do good, Unfortunately, the world in which we're doing that often challenges us uh, to keep it about what we're doing good for, and that's building God's kingdom, uh, not our own glory, our own success, our own desire to do good for others. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that this afternoon. Um, I'm going to do that in three ways. I'm going to start by just sharing a little bit about my story. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what I mean by the... Uh, the paradox of being a Christian entrepreneur. And then I'm going to hopefully give you a couple ideas to think about it uh, and understand uh, potentially how we can, we can avoid that or uh, solve that, if you will. Um, so very quickly, and, and Catherine did a nice job of, of sharing my story, but um, just quickly, I'm going to share a little bit about my story, and then I'm going to give you a quick video on my school. I think that will give you the best understanding of who we are. Um, but I did leave college. I went to Wall Street. I worked for four years. Uh, and then I left Wall Street to go work for a Catholic grammar school called Holy Cross School in the South Bronx. Uh, and I was really a do-whatever-it-took kind of guy up in the South Bronx. Um, we didn't know how to raise money. We didn't know how to balance a budget. Uh, we didn't know how to do a lot of things at that school. And I was called to go up there and I taught a class. I helped them figure out how to raise a little money and how to balance a budget for the first time. Um, and so I did that for a little bit of time. And then as Catherine said, I went over to start a school, uh, to, to work at a school called Link Community School in Newark, New Jersey, um, which was actually a, a school started by Catholic nuns, um, but was, a, it was a, uh, not a parochial school. Uh, and then I found myself looking for a new opportunity about six years later and went out to help create uh, the Denver School of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show this video, and this will give you a two-minute clip of who we are. To give you a little bit of background, um, I can, I'm proud to say that uh, you may have seen that the president uh, has created what they call the Race to the Top Commencement Challenge. 
uh, which over a thousand high schools in the country applied. Uh, and just last week, the uh, president, the White House, selected six schools nationally to be finalists. And the Denver School of Science and Technology is one of those six finalists. You're going to need to vote for us next week as we produce a new video. Um, <laughs> we'll be producing a new video, and there'll be a national actually vote uh, on the White House website to select the top three in which the president will choose the, the school that he will go and deliver a high school commencement this year. So this is a two-minute clip that we submitted with our application in March. All students, regardless of background, regardless of race, regardless of economic family condition, can go to a four-year college and can succeed equally. We stand for the proposition that everyone in the community should be served well by public schools. This is an urban school aimed at an urban American population. We have every ethnic group. It's open enrollment. We're not looking for selectivity. We're trying to provide access for all kids to the American dream of becoming the next innovator in our society. One time in the morning meeting, we had this whole conversation on how we take pride in being a nerd school. When I was in elementary school, being called a nerd was an insult, but now it's like, you know, you're at the top of your class and just intelligent, and you know what you're doing, have a good head on your shoulders. So. I appreciate being called here. We tried to create a culture here that says we affirm where you are. You have an important place in our community, and you have important gifts that we want to develop in you, yet we're going to challenge you and hold you accountable to be extraordinary. These kids are all being offered a very sophisticated liberal arts high school program with a focus on science, and they're stepping up and they're doing it. The best thing is the people. They kind of helped shape me into who I am today to be able to call myself a leader. There were times when I was nervous about all the hard work getting in for 10th grade for the first year. That was really tough, but all the teachers that were supporting me, they didn't, they didn't grab my hand and pull me through. They were letting me know my own strength, and uh, that really helped. So just to give you a sense of where we're going as an organization, we have created a management organization. We'll be opening uh, eight more schools on four campuses to serve 4,200 students in Denver, which will be about 12% of the 612 public school population in Denver. Uh, and with that 4,200 students and 12%, we hope to get the same number of four-year college-ready students that the rest of the district is getting with the other 88% of the students. Uh, so we are a growing organization. We're currently raising $21 million to support this growth plan, uh, and it's a very exciting time. But this is where I would uh, turn to the next part of my, my talk this afternoon, which is, so what is this paradox of, of being a Christian entrepreneur? And I think um, I, I would say two things before I get to that. Number one is, um, like churches, schools are in the business of developing people. And uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is develop what I would say, uh, in my own view, a, a, an understanding of the human condition. And so um, my understanding of the human condition as, as it relates to my work and my life is, is really two things. One is that uh, we all, as human beings, desire to be fully affirmed for the uniqueness that we've been created to be. We all long for that. We all desire that affirmation, yet at the same time, we all long to contribute significantly with our lives to a larger story. And uh, I think that view of the human condition is, is a part of all of us. When I talk about entrepreneurs, I think we as entrepreneurs oftentimes want to live that view of the human condition on steroids. We want more, faster, sooner. We want more affirmation for our uniqueness. We crave for bigger impact in that story that we want to contribute to. Um, and I think therein lies the challenge uh, for entrepreneurs is how to reconcile 
that desire with what we're called to do with our faith and, and with our relationship with God. So as you think about the, the, the paradox that I'd like to put out there today, um, there's really two sides of this. I think on one hand, um, we desire to live according to the plan that God has for our life. We desire to do that for his glory. We desire to do that to renew the kingdom on this earth. And I think we all as Christian entrepreneurs start with that belief. The challenge, I think, particularly in today's world of entrepreneurship, uh, is how to maintain that. Because we also work in this world today where, as we all heard even this morning, capital is tight. Resources are tight. And so we work in this world today that says it's about the leader. It is about a vision. It's about hitting metrics and milestones every day to get that next tranche of either for-profit or non-profit capital. We have to walk around with a 100-page business plan to attract the kind of capital we need for our enterprises. And so the message from the what I would call the social or for-profit or non-profit entrepreneurial world is you, the leader, are who we're looking to for that. And so as I think about that, that those two worlds, it's very hard, I think, to continue to reconcile that worldview of I entered this to do the work of renewing God's kingdom at the same time that you're being told every day that you as a leader of an entrepreneurial organization need to have the vision, the work ethic, the results to continue to warrant the kind of investment that we all need to do our work. And so that is a paradox that I have struggled with over and over again, and I imagine that there's many of you out there in this room that have struggled with that very same challenge. Um, I can think about that in a couple ways. Number one, um, very simple, right? Going out in our world to foundations and, and venture philanthropy organizations where they literally look at you and say, this is about you. We want to know everything about you, and you actually are the key determinant of our decision. That's a challenge to maintain that, that, that worldview of, of both humility at the same time projecting the kind of vision and confidence that you know they're looking for at the other side of the table. I can think about just the competition over resources which now requires us as an organization and probably many of you to deliver great results every quarter. We're a nonprofit, but we have to deliver metrics now for our investors every quarter. There again is this complete tension of, is it about how we do the work and how we do that to renew the kingdom and, 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 and honor our faith? Or is it about the results that we have to deliver tomorrow to keep this great work going. Those are a few examples, I think, of the challenges that I face, and I'm sure that you all face many of the same challenges, perhaps in just a slightly different way. A couple other questions that I think this raises for me all the time, and I'm sure some of these may resonate with you, uh, maybe with different metrics or different situations, but is serving more students God's plan for redemption or my plan for significance? How do I reconcile leaders' need to hold underperforming staff accountable for the good of the mission, yet demonstrate God's grace in my work? How do I reconcile the work it takes to create a great organization versus my Christian obligations to family, community, and faith? When does serving low-income students turn into my end, not God's? And lastly, am I called to be great by God, or is that my own idol of success calling? These are questions that I think I constantly struggle with, and there are many more that I'm sure you have as well that I think define that paradox for me every day. So, so how do I, as an entrepreneur, try to reconcile that paradox? How do I try to live the vision that Tim shared with us just a couple minutes ago and apply that in the life that I lead every day? Uh, I don't think I'm that successful at it. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not struggling with that idol of success without struggling with that, that tension that I feel of both wanting to promote the work that we need to promote to continue, quote, God's work, at the same time doing that with the humility that I know I'm called to be. 
Here are four, four ideas that I think I can just share with you quickly. One is I think it's really praying for humility and understanding every day. I think one of the things that's so important to our work is understanding that all the success that we've had as an organization is not our doing. And praying for that every day. I think that's so critical uh, to understanding that, that our success is not just because of our hard work. And I, and I think about you know, 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 7, where it says, we should not take pride in, in one, take pride in one many over another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you do not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? The second thing I'd leave you with is investing in the personal. I, I think one of the things that we're called to as Christian leaders is to, is to look at our leadership as something more than just what people do for you and what the organization performs, but to invest both in the people in your organization on a professional and a personal level. Uh, I, I believe that part of that is extending grace to people in the organization. I think grace is an essential element of the human story, uh, and it's an essential element of any organization, secular or non-secular. Um, and, and so I, I, would, I, I would certainly think about this in one way, which is employment decisions. And one of the things that I've tried to do in our leadership is we do, we are a high accountability organization. I will, we are, there's no doubt about it. But I also have tried to create in our leadership team a sense that we're going to give people every chance to meet our expectations and that we as an organization, I as a leader, will do everything I can to help that person meet those expectations. Or if they don't, to help them find something that will fulfill them and their talents. And so I think that's one area that, that investing in the personal, making that process enormously personal uh, in the organization, I think is really important. Number three, very quickly, I think is just trying to maintain a long-term perspective. I think we all know that God works in the long term. And so I think to the extent that um, you're not in the position of taking shortcuts, that's good. I don't think God takes shortcuts. Um, and so I think it's, it's really trying to think about how can we create an outlook in the organization that says we're going to do the right thing for the long term to let God work in my work as a leader and to, and to provide him the space to do that. And I think when you take a long-term view, you do that. I think the, the fourth thing, and I think maybe the most important thing, is to live a life of gratitude. I think it comes back to, a little bit to the first point, um, but I think... Being grateful for what God has done in my life as a leader every day is very important because uh, he has blessed me, I know, in many, many ways. And I think um, Henry Nouwen, I think, is very good on gratitude. If you haven't read his work, I think he's very good on it. And, and, and he makes the point many times that um, by blessing others, um, God will bless you and, and, and they will ultimately bless you. And, and I think the most powerful quote that he speaks to this is when he says, you know, what fascinates, fascinates me so much is that every time we decide to be grateful, it will be easier to see new things to be grateful for. Gratitude begets gratitude, just as love begets love. So those are four just uh, simple but I think important strategies that I have tried to use to, to, to start to unpack that Christian uh, entrepreneur paradox that I've sp spoken about. But I want to add one twist at the end here, which is, um, I'm sure many of you have seen the book Good to Great by Jim Collins. Has, has, has most people read that? Um, so it's a really good leadership book. If you have not read it and you're interested in the entrepreneurial space, I would really encourage you to read that. Um, but in that book, um, Jim really looks at organizations over 20 or 30 years that have demonstrated extraordinary outstanding excellence over many business cycles. And he looks at different facets of those organizations, one of which is leadership. And he looks at what he calls level five leaders. And he's, he found that almost in every case in highly successful, long-term, sustained, excellent organizations, there is a level five leader or set of leaders at the top for a long time. So here what he writes about the qualities of level five leaders. Level five leaders want to see the company even more successful in the next generation.
comfortable with the idea that most people won't even know that the roots of that success trace back to their efforts. By comparison, most other leaders concerned with their own reputation for personal greatness often fail to set the company up for success in the next generation. Those who wrote about good to great leaders, employees largely, use words like quiet, humble, modest, reserved, shy, gracious, mild-mannered, self-effacing, understated, did not believe his or her own clippings. They don't talk about themselves. Level five leaders look at the window to apportion credit to factors outside themselves when things go well. And if they can't find a person responsible, they take they credit good luck. At the same time, they look in the mirror to apportion responsibility, never blaming bad luck when things go poorly. And ironically, he finished this section of the book by saying, strong religious belief or conversion can nurture level five traits. That sound familiar? Virtually all of what Jim Collins writes about, I believe, fits into what I would call my gospel-centered paradigm of great leadership. Gospel-centered leadership is great leadership. When you hold a Christian worldview, I think it all makes sense when you put those two things together. I don't think God would design it any other way. And I think God has intended us to solve the paradox of the Christian entrepreneur through our own walk with him. It is a part of our faith journey as Christians, as entrepreneurs, as professionals to replace our idols with him. My problem is I just haven't gotten there yet. So I'd be happy if I have time. I don't know if there is time to take any questions. No time. All right. Good. Well, thank you very much.